right. Thanks, Stephanie. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ISCAP Holocaust and Literature Seminar Series. Today, we have with us a person who holds many roles, Dr. Robert Wolf. Robert Wolf, MD, grew up as the only child of Irwin and Judith Wolf. Their stories of escape from communist Hungary and his father's tragic history of escaping the Nazis twice, but having his own parents deported to Auschwitz, inspired him to document his parents' tales and share those stories with Jewish groups and others throughout the United States. His book, Not a Real Enemy, Robert shares his family saga and the forgotten history of the nearly half million Hungarian Jews who were deported and killed during the Holocaust through an epic and inspiring tale of daring escapes, terrifying oppression, tragedy, and triumph. It is an honor to have you with us, Robert. Over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is, it's truly an honor, a privilege. I'm very humbled by the invitation. Dr. Berza, appreciate you uh, having me on the uh, having me on here, um, and thank you so much to the ISGAP. Uh, of course, uh, much appreciated. Uh, I hope I get uh, to meet each and every one of you someday, maybe in uh, merry old England, beautiful country. I was just in London last year. Uh, hopefully, someday I'll make it out there and for uh, one of your annual meetings, and uh, that would really be an honor as well. <clears throat> I have a few announcements about uh, my book. Um, first of all, not a real enemy: the true story of a Hungarian Jewish man's Fight for Freedom, biography about my dad, has won four awards, and I, I don't even know what to do with that. Um, it's not exactly new news, but it is great news. Uh, the, the thing, I guess, that strikes me the most is that uh, people, important people, are recognizing uh, the importance of our work and the quality of our work, and, and it really means it, it means uh, the world to me, So, uh, as does this invitation. Another announcement is that uh, I will be doing a two-day book signing uh, on April 12th and 13th at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., another really amazing honor. Uh, that'll be from one to four in the afternoon, both days. Uh, please stop by and say hi if you want to buy a copy of the book, or if you have a copy of the book, I'd be happy to sign it, discuss the book, uh, talk about anything you want. But uh, it would be great to see some people there, and I, I really look forward to that. It's uh, yet uh, another true honor. Uh, that uh, invitation. So this is a really big month for me, a big week for me. Um, the other announcement is that uh, throughout my lifetime, 10% of my author proceeds uh, from the sales of, of my book uh, will be going to the United States Holocaust Museum in DC. Uh, that will be ongoing uh, posthumously as well. It's in my trust, my will, and uh, I'm proud to be able to do that uh, uh, in honor of my parents' legacy. So with all that said, here we go. We'll do a little bit of a talk about the book and then uh, some questions will be more than welcome, of course. Uh, so, well, thanks again for having me. And uh, when I was growing up in Michigan uh, in the 60s and 70s, I, I couldn't comprehend my parents as having lives before I was born. I knew they'd come from Hungary and I knew they'd fled Europe after the war. And then my dad's parents had been killed. But Hungary seemed as far a place as World War II. And I didn't have much interest. As I grew, I came to learn about the Holocaust. And I knew it was horrible. And I knew my parents were right in the middle of it. But it was a world so abstract to me that I couldn't comprehend it, so I didn't. My parents never talked about their younger lives that much. My mother, Judith, or Judith, was a homemaker, happy to cook and care for me, and devoted her life to her family. And of course, religious organizations such as Ord and our Temple Sisterhood, while educating people about history and the Holocaust, I couldn't imagine her having a life outside her family. As for my father, Irvin Wolf, he was a joyful, enthusiastic, energized, and charismatic guy. I knew he was clever. After all, he was a doctor. And as a respected obstetrician, all I could imagine of my dad was his life devoted to bringing lives into the world. Their lives before my birth hadn't really impacted me, not until I was grown. My dad began to tell me more about what happened during those wartime years. It was only then that the horrors of the Holocaust went from a history lesson that my parents had survived to a shocking realization of just what had truly happened to them. Far worse, I began to realize the devastating truth of how my grandparents had risen to a life of wealth and great social respect, only to be brutally murdered by the Nazis for the crime of being Jewish. Yet as my father revealed his story to me, which my parents and I recorded over many years, as I listened and took detailed notes, what struck me beyond the tragedy was how inspiring and miraculous his story turned out to be. 
The congenial and witty doctor that I knew was not the ordinary man I thought my father to be. He was a man who had outwitted the Nazis, escaping from their imprisonment not once, but twice. A man who endured unspeakable loss, who survived on his wits while hiding out in a series of secret buildings and secret rooms, who engaged in outlandish adventures, and then, when he thought it was all over and he could finally live as a free man at last, the communists took over, and he found himself engaged in a series of cloak and dagger escapades as he set out to escape Europe once and for all. In my book, Not a Real Enemy, the true story of a Hungarian Jewish man's fight for freedom, I tell my father's story. I don't want to give too much away because I hope you read about his journey and find it as amazing as I did, but I do want to talk about some of the feelings his story inspired. The first is loneliness. We all know what it is to feel alone, even when surrounded by others. I can't imagine how lonely my dad must have felt when he was forced to leave his family at the age of 19. He'd never even spent a night without them. And after his first escape from the forced labor camp, after a long and clumsy all-out foot race for his own freedom, forced to hide for hours in the cold and wintry thicket of the Caspian foothills, I have no doubt my dad was scared and lonely. He was just a kid, a kid who knew that he'd be killed if he was caught, and so he risked being eaten alive by bears or wolves rather than risk another night of the guard's brutality. Yet loneliness was something he knew well. As he was growing up in Hungary, an only child, he was bullied for being a Jew, for not being Jewish enough when he lived among the Orthodox, for living in the wrong neighborhood, for not fitting in. Let me read to you an excerpt from the book when my father had just arrived at the labor camp and recognizes a friend from school. Thank God for Frank, Irvin thought. He had never needed anyone like he felt he needed Frank at that moment. Frank would not just be a familiar face in the midst of this horrible ordeal. His common sense and leadership were just the thing Irvin needed now that he was under the control of these brutes. A friend like Frank could help him get through it, he was certain. The question was, what did he offer to what did he have to offer Frank besides mere friendship? He'd prayed he'd find the answer, because in that flick of a second when she recognized Frank's face through the stable's darkness, the intensity of his need for just a friend swept over him. I'll be damned, Irvin called out to his old friend, Frank Moore. Come here, I've got something for you. And with that, he unwrapped all he had to offer, a few crescent cookies and some cold pierogies. It wasn't much, but in that cold and lonely moment in a stable built for livestock, it was the most generous gift Irvin could provide to the friend who gave him more than mere camaraderie. Having Frank beside him would give him hope that he would survive. After the war, as the communists watched his every move, listen in on his private conversations, monitor his movements, imprison his friends and colleagues, turning one against the other, recruiting spies among his fellow medical students, and then among his colleagues, he learned to remain silent. Even after marrying my mother, who herself was a medical student, they were forced into a solitude together. No one could be trusted, yet no one could survive alone. One lesson I learned from my father was that loneliness is a part of the human condition, but it needn't mark us as outsiders. We must depend on others, even as we do with caution. Our loneliness is an ex existential state, but ultimately we are inextricably linked to the lives and fates of others, and importantly, we are ultimately never alone. God is by our side every step of the way, even in our most isolating moments. Another feeling my father's story brings up is humiliation. Day by day, the indignities my dad, his family, and friends endured mounted. They were told where to stand and how to stand, where to live and how to live, denied the right to own a radio, denied the right to practice medicine, denied the right to work. For my father's father, these humiliations came after years of struggle to become a doctor, to acquire wealth, to raise his family in a grand home where they were all respected. But no sooner had he achieved those honors that they were chipped away. First, he was told he couldn't practice medicine, so he became a dentist. Then he was told he could not work, that his son must be sent to hard labor, that he could not mix with Gentiles, that he must wear that ridiculous yellow star, marking him as unworthy, and ultimately, that he could not live. My father's own humiliations mounted, but he would not let his humi humiliation define him. He refused to embrace the identity of the Nazis, and later the communists tried to impose upon him. Each of us has endured our own humiliations, and yet how they pale in comparison to what our Jewish ancestors endured. How much stronger we become when we accept our humiliation as a test of our endurance, of our own sense of who we are and our place in society. Only by forging our own identities do we cast off those identities others may confer upon us. Here's another excerpt from a scene in the labor camp where my father had been subjected 
to repeated humiliations and abuse. Though the men had hoped that over time the guards would be kinder to them, once they got to know them and saw them as fellow men, the opposite proved true. It was as if the, the more the guards came to know the men, the more emboldened they became to abuse them, perhaps because they had learned that no act, no matter how brutal, would be punished, whereas any kindness they showed would be. Whatever the cause, the guards delighted in their cruelty. When the men were working in the deep wells, the guards would amuse themselves by urinating on them, turning the holes they dug into veritable latrines. Yet the humiliation didn't bother the men so much because the more they were peed on, the more satisfied the guards were that they had inflicted sufficient degradation on their charges, thereby lessening the chance of a beating. It was the beatings the men feared the most. There's also the theme of integrity, which is alive on every page. My father would never have survived had he not had integrity. Throughout the book, my father's integrity and that of several others proves to be the saving grace that kept him and others alive. My grandfather as well proved to be a man of integrity, and many scenes show how his integrity, which in the end could not save him nor my grandmother, saved the life of their son, if not directly, then indirectly, but high, by how he raised my father. When dad had been sent to the labor service, my grandparents were worried that he would not survive because he'd been so spoiled and had no experience with hard work. But they underestimated how far integrity would take Irvin, who came to realize that it wasn't just his own life that was at stake, but that of his friends and fellow prisoners. His determination that no one would die because of his actions, his failures, or his mistakes compelled my father to find the strength to carry on, to work harder, and to rise above the horror. Because of his integrity, others learned to trust my dad, and because of the integrity of others, he survived. In our world today, it's easy to despair, but I'll bet you there's not one of you out there that hasn't been blessed by the integrity of another who hasn't demonstrated your own integrity when it most mattered. Learning my father's story inspired in me to always act with integrity and to live up to his own high standards of how we treat our others and ourselves. Another excerpt from the book. As they reached the town center, the men noticed masses of marching military columns, occasionally interrupted by armored trucks or horse-drawn wagons. The striking difference between the two, one a symbol of power and might and igniting fear in the hearts of the men, the other a symbol of simplicity and self-reliance, conjuring peace and safety. If not a world before the war, caused the men to reassess whether they ought to be so bold as to approach anyone at all. The alternative is we become thieves just to eat, Irvin said, and I'd rather bank on people having a good heart than darkening my own. I'm with you, Frank said, as he was a man of integrity himself, but we need to be careful. Agreed, Irvin said, just as a couple of well-dressed men came out of a building they were passing. Good afternoon, soldiers, one of the men said, tipping his hat. The other did the same, and no sooner had Irvin and Frank returned the greeting that one of the men asked, what brings you to our town? We don't have many soldiers out here other than those trucks and tanks that pass us by. Irvin gave them their cover story, which promptly brought more questioning. The more he answered their questions, Frank stepping back and keeping conspicuously quiet so as not to contradict or confuse the explanation, the more nervous Irvin became. What had become a friendly greeting was quickly advancing to a suspicious interrogation. Look, the man, the more vocal one said in a lower tone, stepping away from the street and closer to the building as if it were a safer place to be away from the passersby. No one gets lost out here. You're Jews and you've made a run for it. Finally, there's hope. My father was a soft spoiled only child who hadn't done a lick of work in his life. He didn't even have to make his own bed. There was a maid to do that. When he was sent to the Nazi controlled labor service, a brutal work camp for Jews who were considered too inferior for national service and only fit for the most arduous unpleasant tasks like digging deep ditches in the dead of winter laying the ground for an airport strip with their bare hands, marching across the country in scorching heat or icy winters, all with barely enough food to keep them alive. Another excerpt. As time went on, small graces helped the men to endure the realities of their fate. Irvin learned from Mike's father, who inexplicably was allowed a very rare visit and brought news from the outside world that the guards could be bribed. Though the guards never spoke directly to the men unless it was to deliver orders or rebukes, and never looked them in the eye, through small acts of bribery, a silent contract had developed. Some young men received a bit more food, a few less punishments, even extra clothing. Fortunately, it wasn't long before Irvin learned that his own father had met with the guards, offering free dental treatment for their families, 
as well as cash, and Irvin received a visit from one of the guards not long after. Wolf! Irvin sprang to attention, ready to withstand whatever was coming. He looked up and saw Janosch, the guard who'd served them sausages at the earlier camp, jerk his head for Irvin to come to him. Irvin complied, standing at attention before the funny-looking man. Janosch had tiny eyes buried in a face so pockmarked he looked like almost like a, bur a burn victim. He was quite hideous, but Irvin concluded that it may have been his ugliness which rendered him more sympathetic than the other guards. Still, he was a guard, and Irvin had long since concluded that even the kindness of guards held power over him, and no one holds power without employing it. Thus, when Janosch commanded Irvin to approach, Irvin was as cautious as he was obedient. Your parents want you to have this, he said, his voice low and neither kind nor cruel. He handed Irvin a small paper packet as discreetly as if he were passing a valet a well-earned tip, and then turned and barked orders to a nearby group of men. Irvin used the diversion to sneak back to his bunk and open the packet. Inside was a chain of gold with a simple four-leaf clover charm, a small ruby embedded in the center. Irvin had never, received, never before received jewelry from his parents, but this golden four-leaf clover was the most treasured gift he'd ever opened, not for it being gold, but for it being a symbol of their optimism and hope that he'd be home soon. He turned the charm over and saw that they had the charm engraved. In remembrance from your parents, 1943 X4. A tear fell from Irvin's face, followed by another, then another. 1943, the year he had last seen his family. <clears throat> X was the Roman numeral for the month of October and four for the day he departed just a few months earlier. The tears fell heavily now as he realized how momentous that day had been and how much that date was etched not just upon the golden charm, but also upon his parents' hearts. Coincidentally, or possibly not, my bar mitzvah was on October 4th, 32 years later. The despair my father and his fellow laborers felt was palpable. But amid that despair, deep and lasting bonds were formed with his friends and fellow prisoners and small tokens like a simple kindness, a shared bit of food, a funny story late at night, brought the comfort and glimmer of hope they each needed to endure the unendurable. In these troubled times in our own nation and others, times that in some ways echo the early days of the rise of fascism and in other ways don't even come close, we would do well to embrace that hope. We live surrounded by comforts and kindness, yet how easily we lose the sight of all that we have. Reading stories like that of my father can teach us to find hope in the darkest moments. For my father, hope kept him alive when he felt dead. Hope kept him going, gave him the courage he needed to dare his most dangerous escapes, and hope gave him the certainty that his pain would pass. We are living in troubling times, and the rise of anti-Semitism in our nation and across the globe is shockingly great. Whether the rise of anti-Semitism or the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 that my father quite literally stumbled upon as he made his way home, the lessons of the past are alive and with us. Let's think about these lessons as we live our lives in freedom. I do hope you'll read my father's story because I have no doubt that you'll find in his story the same inspiration that he brought to me, inspire me to never give up hope, to live a life of integrity, to never let anyone else shame or define me, and to never forget that while life comes with tragedies, some so great that they're unspeakable, our future is our own to make. I'd like to tell you that once the Nazis were gone, Irvin's life got better. And though he did get into medical school, finally, and he did find employment as an obstetrician, life under the communists proved to be another challenge. There was a saying, the crocodiles have gone, but the alligators have arrived. And I think that pretty much sums up what was going on in Hungary during those years. Dad even paraphrased, out of the frying pan, into the fire. One only needs to look at Ukraine to realize that things haven't changed much, eh? In closing, I'd like to leave you with these thoughts. Although few people know the story of what happened to the Hungarian Jews during the Holocaust, nearly half a million were deported, as my grandparents were, most going to, straight to Auschwitz where they were killed. Almost all who survived were the ones like my father who were serving in the deplorable labor camps where beatings, starvation, and death marches were common. In Not a Real Enemy, I've tried to tell the story of the Hungarian Jews during the Holocaust and their fate under Stalin's communism. Every Jew who lived there during those times has their own story to tell, and this is just one among the over 825,000 Jews who lived in Hungary prior to the war. As my father's story shows, there are fine lines between good and evil, war and peace, love and hate, 
hope and despair, tolerance and prejudice, right and wrong. I wish that the lines were much thicker rather than so fine, but I'm immensely proud to know where my family stood. Through all those harrowing years, my father exhibited immeasurable determination to not only survive against steep odds, but also once he had survived such unspeakable atrocities, once he learned about his parents' fates and the fates of so many other people he cared about, either during the reign of the Nazis or the reign of the communists, dad was determined to not be destroyed. The very fact of his survival became a pledge to God and to the memory of his parents to fully live his life. When I started out this story, and I started out on this journey six years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into, despite the many stories that my parents shared with me and others. And I hope that I've done their story and history justice. And I do hope you'll buy my book and share your thoughts with me. I want my father's story to do more than entertain you. I wanted to inspire you in these difficult times so that you will know, just as my father came to know, that you are stronger than you realize. And our nation, as well as the free world, is as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I would like to hear any questions from you, comments. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. That was amazing. And for the audience, I highly recommend buying Robert's book. It's an amazing read. And if you're interested, please find my review on Goodreads as well. So I, I appreciate uh, you saying that. I have to thank you for that. I, I've been thanking you for uh, setting up the uh, talk, but you also wrote a, a very nice review of the book, and I appreciate that as well. So more than above and beyond. Thank you. Um, so I see, okay, there are compliments beautifully done. Um, so before, while the audience search for their questions, I'll like to begin one. Um, since you said you mentioned in your slide that we are living in troubled times. So how do you think the content of your book would help fight anti-Semitism? Well, we're doing it here. I mean, it's it's one person at a time. It's one talk at a time. Ultimately, I would like the book to be taught in the classroom. Uh, I've donated about 200 copies of the book. Uh, it's uh, it's available at the Holocaust Center in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, Yad Vashem, I've donated a copy. Uh, several Holocaust museums here in Florida. Um, I, I just do uh, podcasts about it, TV interviews, radio interviews, uh, talks like this. Uh, the more people that learn about how harrowing the times are, uh, the better the, the better the support that I'll get. And I can't fight anti-Semitism by myself, but by doing this, spreading the word and people re reading the book, which uh, it has actually transformed many people's ways of thinking. Uh, many from my high school, uh, many people going even back to elementary school, myself included. Uh, when I read this book, I was so inspired and, and amazed by the stories that uh, it really transformed my way of thinking and, and how lucky we are in the real world, the, the free world, and uh, I may not be able to convert uh, the radical Islam in Gaza or Hamas. That's probably never going to happen. But uh, for 99% of us that live sort of a peaceful, normal life where we care about uh, food, family, shelter, careers, uh, we're, we're slowly uh, we're rallying and recruiting people to, to understand uh, how wrong anti-Semitism and how we should learn uh, about the, uh, the perils of the past and adjust the way our lives are. So uh, little by little by slow as they say, uh, a movie would be great someday. That's kind of a pipe dream. If the book were ever a movie, uh, we all know it's Schindler's List and we all, uh, we all know Anne Frank's story and uh, the recent movie this last year that won, uh, uh, that just won uh, the Oscar or was an nom Oscar nomination. And uh, nobody knows who my dad was. Nobody knew, knows who I am. But when people do read the story, they will know who my dad was and, and what it's all about. And uh, there's so many miracles and it just uh, I talk about a gift from God it's just amazing so it's insp it's inspiring it's it's dedicated and i'll keep doing it as long as as long as i can as long as i can talk and share and people read the book will uh, will it'll help so um we have a question and the question is do you think will zionism save the jewish people why did the republicans attach their agenda to the zionist cause I'm not real political, so I'm going to save that uh, that question for the for the politicians. Uh, Zionism, uh, some people call that it's, it's an extremism, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure what the difference is if whether you're racist or you're anti-Zionist or you're an anti-Semitic. 
I've heard so many definitions thrown across the thrown through the uh, the electronic pages and and elsewhere. It's really hard to it's hard to answer. I think that uh, everybody's entitled to their own piece of property. Uh, the, whatever happened in Gaza, it was an accelerant. It was it was just ignited by a handful of people. It wasn't ignited by thousands and thousands of people, but it was it was tragic tragic. But um, they have a voice. Uh, I hate uh, I hate what's going on there. I hate what's going on in Ukraine. Um, Zionism, I think the people of Israel are entitled to their home nation, especially if you live there or you've had family live there for many years. Uh, they've tried to work out uh, sharing the land with Gaza, uh, making peace with the other Arab states. Zionism, uh, if people think of it, it's extreme, I, I don't know. I'm not that extreme. I'm more right of center uh, in my own political viewpoint. I, I like a reasonable thought. I like uh, peace, not violence. I like fiscal responsibility, uh, immigration control. Uh, things like that. I, I'm not. I'm not big into malfeasance and war and protests and violence. It's just not my style. So, uh, people are entitled to their opinions. But when it comes to being violent, killing people, threatening them, torturing them, I, I disagree with that part of it. So, uh, and there are plenty of Zionists down here in Florida too. And and uh, they're trying to, to. Some of them are trying to uh, have me buy into that thought. But I, it's not for me. I, I just don't want to fight. I've got great friends that are Muslim. I have great friends that are Hindu. I have great friends that are Christian and Jewish. I'm a tolerant guy and uh, it's people are people. So I, I don't like to label people as anything, a terrorist, a Zionist. I mean, a terrorist is a terrorist, a fancy name for murder, a murder, and that, that's completely wrong. But uh, whether somebody's a Zionist or not, nobody has the right to kill them or to change their lives just on the base of their beliefs, as long as that person is uh, reciprocate, reciprocating that kind of uh, treatment. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions. So while the audience is at it, um, let me follow up with a few more questions. Um, I would like to know, okay, we do have a question. Um, great, it, it's a comment. That's a human matter, not a political one. Uh, so Robert, tell me the story behind the title because not a real enemy. When I first looked at the title, it intrigued me to a certain extent. So what is the story behind the title? And uh, I'm sure you must have undergone a roller coaster of emotions while writing the book. So uh, tell me something more about, I'm sure the audience would like to know about the history of the book and the story behind the title. A uh, great question. I love when people ask me that. Um, I'll start with this part two of the question is the emotions, emotional roller coaster indeed, even now. I mean, writing the book, rewriting the book, re-editing the book, uh, I couldn't I couldn't stop doing it because I was so uh, magnetized to it. But uh, yeah, sometimes I had to walk away. Uh, like when we talk about Auschwitz and my grandparents passing away in Auschwitz, uh, when I, read, I wrote the original version, uh, my dad's autobiography turned bio, um, I, I literally walked away for a week. Um, maybe I cried every day, every other day, just thinking about the history. Uh, maybe it was a little bit too late that I did it. Maybe I should have done this project while they were still alive. What are you going to do? You've got life, you've got family, you've got a career. So uh, there's regrets, but in the end, I'm glad I did it. Uh, very emotional. It's 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 uh, happy. It's sad. Uh, when I get bad news, like uh, let's say a Holocaust Museum has no room for me to do a talk or a presentation, I, I get more. I'm more mad about that, but I'm really not that mad. But I but I'm I cry with joy when I get events like this or this book signing and at the Holocaust Museum. I I, I hope that it makes my parents proud. I hope I'm doing them justice as they were Holocaust educators all their lives. Part one is the history of the book. So the history of the title, actually, there's two questions there. So the history of the book, my dad did his autobiography in the 70s. They wrote it uh, as though the, the events had happened the previous day. They were very sharp. They were Holocaust educators. They were history educators. They were very smart, well-rounded people. They had many other interests like travel and education and uh, the arts, uh, theater, uh, opera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then they put the, from the, the story went from pencil and paper to a typewriter, to a computer, to a disc. Uh, we'll flash forward to 1997. My dad passed away, unfortunately. Uh, 2016, my mom passed away, unfortunately. A historian, a friend of ours in the family, uh, Kim Parr, a super, super nice lady, uh, was I met her at my, my mom's funeral and she handed me the disc now of my dad's story and said, you need to read this. And uh, this was my second time around reading it. I, I read the story on a manuscript many, many years ago, but I never really thought of it back then. But uh, once I read it, I said, you know, the story's got to be shared. It can't just sit here on a computer on some piece 
piece of plastic disc. So I, I worked with it and, and moved it moved it along. Uh, it wasn't even actually until 2018 that I started the project because I had to take care of my mom's affairs after she passed and then actually retired for a year. And uh, a friend of mine in Michigan said we were short of radiologists. So would you want to work with us part time uh, out of Michigan, which I still do. And that brought me back to my computer and my office and ultimately the disc. And so so that, that's so 2018 is when I actually started this project um, from autobiography to biography and 20 edits and uh, I've got a. I hooked up with uh, Jan, uh, Janice Harper, my co-author, who's uh, unbelievable, great writer, great book coach, helped make the, the book really, really special. And uh, here we are now. And also Amsterdam Publishers, who a uh, fantastic publishing house, and and they uh, they really helped us. Uh, literally, bottom of the ninth shoestring catch, getting them to pu to publish the book rather than because we we're almost going to self-publish. But so that's the history of the book. Um, and here we are now with uh, the books out and we're trying to circulate and, and talk about it and awards and and uh, just sharing the, sharing the story. So uh, we're going to continue to do more of that uh, henceforth. The title, Not a Real Enemy, uh, it's actually a chapter in the book. Uh, the, the theme resonates uh, throughout the story, uh, Not a Real Enemy. Um, my, my dad's fourth escape, he had four escapes, twice from Nazi Hungary, twice from Communist Hungary. Before his fourth escape, uh, the night before he and my mom left, uh, after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, my dad's risk tolerance by by this point was so high that uh, he snuck into the medical uh, medical staff office uh, between security guards, uh, found his uh, dossier, looked up his uh, records and what they had to say about him. And uh, in their arrogance, the communists described my father as not a real enemy. And uh, in fact, as my co-author uh, has helped uh, point out to me uh, that he was that they that he was a real enemy, and so was my mom because. Uh, the next day, uh, Hungary, who they were loyal to, they were very patriotic to Mother Hungary, not Nazi Hungary or Communist Hungary, but they were loyal to Mother Hungary. They were real enemies because they left the country and you left a potential doctor, you lost a potential doctor, another doctor that was practicing medicine, and only because they wouldn't buy into the, to the system. They wanted to practice medicine and they wanted to be in the free world. So in the end, they were real enemies because they got, they got the heck out of there. Um, I had two other titles in mind before she came up with Not a Real Enemy. Uh, one was uh, the Hungarian papillon, the Hungarian butterfly. And uh, that's if you know the story of the papillon, the great escape artist from uh, Steve McQueen was in the original movie with Dustin Hoffman, a fantastic movie, but a great book too, uh, Devil's Island and the multiple escapes. Uh, he didn't dive off of tall cliffs or anything like that, but pretty harrowing escapes anyway, four of them. I mean, so that was the, the but uh, uh, nobody, we figured the audience under 50 years old wouldn't understand that reference. So we kind of scrapped that. And then the other one I kind of had in the back of my mind was the, the sixth book of Moses, because, you know, the five books of Moses are the Torah and dad's Hebrew name was Moshe. So he was Moshe ben Yosef. I'm Eliezer Yosef ben Moshe, Eliezer, son of, of Moses. So the sixth book of Moses, only because all the miracles that happened to him, uh, it, it could be a, a little bit, sac maybe that's a little sacrilegious. So uh, so not a real enemy. It's it's a chapter. Uh, the theme resonates throughout the throughout the book because the poor man was always on the run just because he was Jewish, starving, and, and no end in sight. You know, we always talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. And Dad and his friend Frank, they're always on the run. So you're either in prison or enslaved or you're running. And where are you running to? You don't you, you don't have a home to go to. You don't have a job. You don't know what you don't know what you're doing. So the poor guy is not a real enemy, and as, as millions of other people were, but. It's an amazing theme, an amazing title, and I have to give my co-author Janice the credit for coming up with that. Surely, I just posted a link, Amazon link to your book. Um, Appreciate that. So there is another question, and Deborah is interested about. Uh, can you share us uh, the details about the upcoming audiobook? Oh, great question. We um, we uh, interviewed we, and we auditioned at least ten or eleven uh, voice uh, voice actors. They were all outstanding. Uh, Deborah Stitt, I see, is uh, in the audience. Thank you, Deborah, because she's she's down here in Southern Florida and really instrumental in helping me uh, vet out uh, a really, really a great group of people. But we did finally hire somebody. Uh, he's from Australia. Uh, after I get back from Washington, D.C., I'm going to have another meeting with him. We already got the guy does not um, procrastinate at all. He's already looked at all the words that might give him difficulty. We're going to go over those as soon as I get back. And hopefully the audiobook is out within a month. That's sort of the plan. Uh, maybe we procrastinate ourselves. It's another side. It's another sidestep. But I know that every week people have asked about getting the audiobook out, and uh, it should be out in a month. Uh, the the guy might have a little bit of an Australian accent, but uh, he's got a great voice, and I think he's going to do this the book really uh, really well. He'll do it some real justice with 
I can't wait to hear the his uh, his version of it. So that's coming out hopefully within the month finally. Great. Um, Juliana is asking, does your book talk about domestic abuse and scapegoating at all? It does. It's a great question. Um, Jeanette is a she's also a fellow Amsterdam publisher's author. I highly recommend her book too. So it's uh, I've got it right here. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we've been on sunny days. We sang is her book, and it's a fantastic book too. Uh, I highly recommend. But uh, um, no, my dad was beaten as a child. I mean, he was beaten by his dad. Maybe that helped him help keep him uh, disciplined. I mean, nowadays in the way society is now, parents can't do that to their kids, or if they do, they can end up. And as you know, I mean, domestic violence is very, very common. Uh, I've just been, I just heard a lecture about that this week from a, a judge who actually bought a copy of my book, which is amazing. But no, my dad was, uh, he was beaten as a kid. I, I don't think my dad's parents uh, were physically abusive. But I guess that was an unwritten thing, but I don't know. Maybe there was this feeling of learned helplessness uh, for the Jewish people. They never really felt safe, even though his dad was a captain uh, on a ship. He was on a Red Cross ship and on the Black Sea in World War I. Uh, he was, they, they all contributed to society, whether they were wealthy or not, but, uh, they had their own little dark times too, I suppose. And maybe it's because, uh, my, he wanted my dad to be a perfectionist. Uh, he wanted him, he knew that, uh, being Jewish was going to be a, a point against him no matter what he did. So I, I think that kind of, uh, that domestic abuse, uh, I mean, he didn't beat him to bloody, to bloody pulp and send him to the, uh, emergency room. But if my dad was late, for example, or, or, or goofy or, or just, uh, out of line, then, then that's what happened. I used to get spankings as a kid too, but it wasn't wasn't often. I mean, I was a good kid, but spankings I think are, are important to me. But you know, not punching in the face and not beating somebody with a ruler or a stick or uh, tying them up or handcuffing them. You know, there's a lot of there's a fine line between uh, discipline and abuse. And I guess my dad, uh, my dad's parents were in there. Maybe it's a little sense of control too. I, I'm really not a big domestic abuse guy either because it's just more malfeasance. But maybe it's a sense of control. That people get when they when everything else around them is is beyond their control if that makes sense all right um oh so uh, yes professor go ahead and um ask a question yourself um yes dr wolf thank you for for your lecture i i haven't actually read your your book uh, so I want to ask if your father ever spoke about the uh, anti-Semitism in Hungary, because as you know, um, 400 and, about 440,000 Hungarians are deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau in, in 1944, over a month and a half. So did he mention to you or in his manuscript anything about this deep-seated anti-Semitism in Hungarian society? Well, it's it resonates throughout the book too. I mean, you, once you start reading this book, you'll you'll see that uh, anti-Semitism is in the backdrop throughout. They the Jews always felt they didn't know who their enemies were. After World War One, there was uh, Admiral Horthy uh, in charge, and then there was the White Terror and the Red Terror, and you, you needed a program just to keep up with uh, who was in who was in charge. And then of course the rise of fascism and then communism. But the Jews always felt, in my mind, that you could feel that uh, no matter who was in charge. They were at risk that they they never felt uh, this sense of safety or security uh which uh, we do in this country in the united states uh, at least i do but uh you know lately who knows but uh no he it's it's talked about a lot and 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 uh of course auschwitz uh, what happened with my dad's parents and my mom's uh uh grandfather also passed away at auschwitz he was a he was a rabbi actually so uh but my dad's parent there was eyewitness uh testimony about what had actually happened to my dad's parents. Miraculously, months after the war, he met uh, he met a lady in his hometown and she told him exactly what had happened to, uh, to uh, his uh, his mom and dad. Fortunately, they weren't in Auschwitz too long. I mean, if you're going to be there, please just put me out of my misery. Cause so fortunately, they weren't there for weeks and months at a time. They, you know, I hate to say it that way, but death is better than starvation or torture or, or whatever else they would have, you know, slave labor, slave labor. So uh, a lot of anti-Semitism in the background, and the and the communists were not so much better than the Jews either. Short of corralling them into into the square and then carting them off in trains under false pre pretenses, I might add, telling them that they're going to be uh, they're going to be doing gardening work or forestry work and 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 helping with cleanup. And instead, what they they take them to the death camp, and and that, that's even worse to me. That deceit, that deception, and that feeling of hope that people that people would have and end up going to some kind of death camp. So. 
uh, yeah, anti-Semitism is, is in the backdrop throughout the book. And, uh, and you, you, you pick it up right away. So, and uh, I think my dad had a sense of learn helplessness too. He always uh, wanted to overcompensate. Uh, and that, I guess that was part of his determination. Uh, you, you're told you're a Jew, you're no good, you're this and that. And you start to believe it. And uh, so you, you fight it off. He's, he's not the type of guy to just say, um, to defend somebody just because they're Jewish. He judges person by person. If that makes sense, and and uh, it's important, and I'm the same way. I judge a person by person, not the race, creed, color, uh, sexual orientation, whatever. It's it's not for me. My parents were the same way. Tolerance is the way to go. Peace is the way to go. And uh, this is exactly what we're fighting. And this is exactly why I put this book out. It's uh, it's more than just a great story. It's there's just so many great messages in it. So. Hey. Um... Uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, your, I'm also interested in uh, knowing about the lives of your parents. Uh, so, after, especially after they left Hungary. So, could you talk a little bit about their demeanor? It's a, another great question. I, I love that. So, well, as you've seen, uh, if you've seen my posts in the last year or so on social media, which <laughs> I haven't done many, <laughs> just daily, right? Um, dad and mom were no sign of PTSD, for for example. Uh, their trip from uh, they once they got to Vienna, Austria, which is where the book ends, we could do a sequel, a part two, which would include their trip from Vienna all the way to the United States, uh, harrowing uh, boat ride. They ironically they left Germany. They had about a month boat ride in January in the North Atlantic, which even the captain said it was the worst uh, conditions uh, for the ocean that he's ever experienced. Uh, leaky uh, leaky hull, leaky bottom, uh, motion sickness, lack of food. Uh, but they they got through it. Uh, met my mom's dad in New York, in New York City. Uh, ended up going to Providence, Rhode Island, uh, not knowing the language, not knowing what their future was. Finally learning English. Uh, my dad finally got to do his uh, residency. He had to redo his residency at the very esteemed Beth Israel in Boston. It's a it's a Harvard affiliate. Uh, I couldn't even get an interview there, let alone a residency of any kind. But uh, but good for him. He uh, he learned English uh, through elementary school and high school. And he wanted to stay in the Boston area, but uh, they um, there were no jobs then. So he ended up getting a, his first job in Detroit. It was a few years before the riots and my dad could feel the uh, the tension and uh, and didn't like uh, how the neighborhood, the, the urban blight that was uh, developing. So they moved to a suburb, Mount Clemens, where I was raised. And uh, and that's where he did most of his uh, most of his practice. Dad uh, delivered uh, over 10,000 babies in the Detroit area. Uh, God bless him. That's called redemption. Uh, and every, with everything that happened, he brought 10,000 lives back into the, this world, which is amazing. Um, and his demeanor was great. He loved his work. He would have worked till the day he died. Everybody that knew him loved him. He was always smiling, laughing, joking. You would never know what he and my mom had been through uh, with all of that. They were they were both, uh, and like I said, they were still Holocaust educators and history educators. And uh, they they taught me about tolerance and they taught me about the fine arts and culture and everything else. So they were very well-rounded people, very happy, and uh, really left it behind. Uh, they never taught me Hungarian, which I don't blame them. It's a hard enough language to learn. Maybe that was their secret language. But I think deep down, they wanted to leave that part of that in the, in the past is, is, is uh, not teaching me the language and move on uh, as Americans. Uh, they were very patriotic Americans. Uh, they were patriotic to Israel and Mother Hungary. And again, not, not repressed Hungary, but Mother Hungary. So very, very delightful, happy people. And uh, I was lucky then this is how I repay their pay them is uh, by by uh, talking about their legacy and what they've done. If you don't have good parents, if you don't have good family, you don't have anything. I mean, that's it's that's what it's all about. Education, love and uh, and honesty. So unbelievable people. Great. So um, in your author's note in the book, um, it begins with a line uh, which says this is a true story or as true to history and life of Aaron Wolf as the author could tell it. So at any point of time while writing the story or after it, have you ever faced the question of authenticity? No, except for you. <laughs> Cause you're, cause everybody says, well, what kind of, what's the genre? Is it historical fiction? Is it historical nonfiction? Is it a biography? You know, I, I still think of it as a biography because uh, I try to keep it as, the fidelity as much as possible. I turned my dad's autobiography right into a biography, literally just putting first person into third person. And then Janice picked it up because we were querying agents and publishers and we weren't getting very far. 
And then so I got the Janice, the co-author, to really turn it into a, to a special book. Uh, uh, there's parallel stories. There's converging stories, conversations, uh, letters to and from home. Uh, fantastic job. But all based on the truth, all based on what my dad said. As a friend of mine says, if dad said that that's what happened, then that's what happened. He, he had no reason to lie. He wrote the stories as though they'd happened the previous day. I've already said that. But they also wrote the thing as though they knew I was going to do this. And believe it or not, if you knew me six years ago, uh, you'd say this guy would never be doing this, uh, out fighting anti-Semitism and talking about the book. Authenticity, I, there's not a word in my dad's autobiography that I would change. We, we Maybe we uh, uh, emboldened, we blossomed it up a little bit. Uh, uh, but uh, it's it's the truth. It's it's his biography. But I I can see where people say because there are a few names that are made up, uh, a few, and a few names we've changed because we heard more about the history of what my dad went through. For example, my dad's friend Frank's daughter uh, Susan is in California and alive and well, and she's been in touch with me after she's heard about the book. She sent me a couple of documents, pictures of Frank, and uh, and a map, which is amazing. They charted out their their trek while they were in their forced labor camp. And what a trek it was. It, it covers most of the northern half of Hungary, full circle, and then some. It's unbelievable. So um, authentic, yes. It's as close as I come to the truth and the biographies we, as we possibly can. Um, and no, there's no uh, lawsuits. I, I mean, I'm an only child of only children. So who's going to, you know, what's the, the truth is the truth. And uh, my dad, all his friends that survived these labor camps stayed with my uh, parents, uh, stayed as friends with my parents for many years. They came to visit us in Michigan, vice versa, and uh, they shared the story. So, uh, no, I don't, uh, I don't have any issues with the authenticity at all. Perfect. And I don't see any more questions in the audience, so I guess that's it from my side. And I'll let you have the last word, Robert. Although you have spoken enough. I appreciate that. Maybe I talk too much. You know, I'm a radiologist too, so I've been a radiologist for 35 years. Uh, born in Detroit, raised in Michigan, lived half my life in Michigan, half my life in New England, uh, in Southern Florida now here for uh, uh, five years and counting. Um, the amazing book, I, I appreciate the time to share. And uh, most people that are on probably have read the book or know about it, but Not a Real Enemy, The True Story of Hungarian Jewish Man's Fight for Freedom. You, uh, I've got a website, uh, robertjwolfmd.com, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about my dad, the tons of videos, tons of content. Uh, and then uh, the book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, uh, Walmart, Tufts University. It's on the bookshelves at the bookstore there, as well as the library. And uh, it's also for sale at the Illinois and the, you know, the United States uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., both of those institutions, hopefully in the next year or so, even more places. But it's easy to find. Just Google me, Robert J. Wolf, MD. Google the book, Not a Real Enemy, and you'll find us. And, and please reach out and share with me if you do actually get a chance to read the book. Uh, I'm so interested in people's feedback. It, it means the world to me. If I just get one person's comment a day or a week and they say, I love the book, it was so moving, this and that, it, it really makes my month. It makes my day. So um, not looking for a lot of glory, but I do want to share the story with as many people as possible. And uh, like you said, it's a great story. Thank you so much. And just share the link to your website. All right. So Robert, thank you so much once again. It was wonderful to have you and it has been an honor to read your book and review it. I appreciate so that. The pleasure was mine. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. So we'll be wrapping up this series next Monday with a final lecture by me. It'll just be a wrap up lecture of what the other presenters have presented. So it'll be at the same time. So don't forget to tune in next Monday. 8.30 Indian time, 11 a.m. EST. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.